SBS advises that the following program includes depictions of drug use. Today is Freedom Day in Portugal, a national holiday that celebrates the country's shift from authoritarian rule to democracy in 1974. <laughs> Away from the parade, local artist Tiago agrees to show me what freedom in Portugal looks like today. I born in 72. After that, OK, so now we can have a good sun. <laughs> we can do people free. Let's do it. Looking around us here, we can see people, looks like they're smoking joints quite openly in the public. Are they likely to get in trouble? No, they don't. It's natural. Everybody smokes joints with, a, with normality. Imagine if we are here, if I want to smoke, I would do it right now, no problem. Portugal was the first country in the world to decriminalise drug use in 2001. And for the last 20 years, people here have been living in experiment. I'm in Lisbon to find out what Australia can learn from Portugal's radical approach. Welcome to my place at Pottery, where I work. You're welcome. This is what I do normally. Useful colored pottery, OK? These are the dishes, for instance. These dishes are completely unique. Nobody does nothing like this. Tiago is a well-known potter in Lisbon. He's also not afraid to admit he's a long-time drug user. The first time I smoked crash, I was 16, maybe. And heroin, first time I smoked it, I was 18. But then it becomes the, the regular using of heroin and crack, and that doesn't stop anymore. How often do you smoke crack cocaine? I smoke it every day. Pipe, the professional one. <laughs> if the police were to walk in now, and saw of you preparing to smoke, would you get in trouble? No, 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 no. What would happen? Uh, well, normally what happens, uh, what are you doing? I'm smoking. You only have that? Yeah, yeah, for sure. Can I see it? Of course you can. They see, OK, I only have that. Normally they give you back, go away. Bye. Under Portugal's decriminalised drug policy, it's not considered a crime to have up to 10 days' worth of drugs for personal use. For marijuana, that's 25 grams. For cocaine, it's two grams. And for heroin, it's one gram. OK, you're a user, no problem, you go home. Uh, a few days later, they, you go to a place, it's a place where they help you. So if they don't judge you, they don't arrest you, they help you treatment. Okay? They try to uh, conduce you to a treatment program, OK? And that's what the, they do. In Australia, Tiago could be sent to prison for two years for the drugs in his possession today. But here in Portugal, police would instead send him to the Commission for the Dissuasion of Drug Addiction for help. Hi, Nuno. Hi, nice to meet you. Nice to meet you. I'm Michelle. Welcome. Welcome. I'm Nuno, one of the members here of the Dissuasion Commission. Welcome. Nuno Capaz was given the task of starting the Specialist Drugs Tribunal and has been in charge ever since. So let's move on. When we decriminalised drug usage in Portugal, we decided to decriminalise all drugs, from cannabis to heroin and everything in between. All the illicit substances are dealt in exactly the same way. What we mean by decriminalising, it's not the same thing as regulating or legalising. The criminalizing means that we do no longer treat it as a criminal offense, but it's still an illegal activity, so we deal with it as an administrative offense. Very similar to driving without the seatbelt or talking on the mobile phone while driving. We do not apply criminal sanctions. 
we do not apply jail sentence, for example, and so the person doesn't get the criminal record out of this procedure. Instead of appearing before a judge, people found using drugs in Portugal meet with a panel of health experts and social workers. The emphasis is on treatment, not punishment, although repeat offenders can be fined. 90% of the people that use illicit substance do it because they like it, and 10% do it because they are addicted to those substances. So there's no penalty that will stop people from liking it or stop people from being addicted to it. You have to give people other options apart from just a simple penalty because the uh, normally drug users do not perceive using an illicit substance, substance as something wrong. So why did Portugal embark on this radical approach to drugs? This neighbourhood is Casal Ventoso. The streets may seem quiet enough now, but up until the early 2000s, this hill was filled with hundreds of people queuing to buy drugs. When democracy arrived in 1974, so did access to the outside world. Along with new prosperity came an influx of drugs. By the 90s, one in 10 people were using heroin and Casal Ventoso was home to the biggest open-air drug market in Europe. José Silva has lived here for 40 years. He tells me that he would regularly see people overdose on drugs right here, outside his front window. On average, one person in Portugal was dying from a drug overdose every single day. These local women saw neighbours succumb to their addictions, from shop owners to students. <laughs> I'm heading to the seaside town of Grandola, south of Lisbon, to meet a former addict who was lucky to survive. Hello, Michelle. Nice How are you? you. Nice to meet you, too. José Díaz de Cunha was 19 years old when Portugal was liberated from authoritarian rule. With the revolution and with the, with the independence of the colonies, mm -hmm. there was lots of Portuguese that came from uh, Angola mm -hmm. and they brought weed. And uh, I had friends that brought over hashish from, from Morocco, so I tried that also. And then a friend of mine, I was in a in a in a booze night, and uh, and and he introduced me to coke, so I said, like, "Wow, a miracle!" Yeah. You know, the alcohol went away. You know, so I could balance alcohol with with the coke. I was smoking heroin. I was chasing the dragon a lot. You know, but the problem is that I could never stop. You know, uh, I could never say wow, this is messing up my life, you know. I had a friend that died in prison with AIDS. We used to use together a lot. And he ended up being arrested and going to jail and dying in, in jail with AIDS. José was high on heroin when his first child was born. I could see my life was a mess. I could see that I, w I was not going to be a, a, a good father to my daughter, I definitely wanted to change, you know, I wanted to find uh, a way. 
Because I wanted to find myself. Vou passar aqui o salmão para aí. José had wealthy parents who sent him to London for rehab. It worked. And on his return to Portugal, he set up one of the first drug treatment centres in the country. He recently retired as its director, but maintains a close relationship with current staff. Now we have a very different kind of patients. Lots of patients uh, with cannabis problems. José was at the forefront of a major shift in Portugal. To tackle the crisis, health and recovery became central to drug policy, rather than criminalisation. Hi. Hi. Hello. Michelle, nice to meet you. Nice to meet you, Andrea. Hi. My Hi. colleague, Martinho. To see this policy in action, I'm meeting Andrea, a government-funded social worker who provides support for drug users. In the past, it was not possible to have all this kind of work and all this support to people who use drugs because in the past, these people were seen like people that should be in the jail, like criminal. And now they are seen like they are people that need help. Não precisas de mais nada? Não, não, obrigada. Ok. Então vá, até amanhã. Today, Andrea's team is visiting known drug use locations to collect used syringes. Olha, está aqui uma seringa. Uh, when people don't have access to a needle, they can pick one from the ground and use. In the past, it was really normal, uh, this kind of behaviour. How many needles would you usually find in a place like this? I don't know, uh, 10, 20 in each place, uh, every day. Sometimes more. There's one here as well. There's like a tip there. Yeah, yes. The diseases are going down uh, and uh, it's really uh, clear. If you look uh, to the statistics, you can see that in the year of the change of the law, like uh, between 2001, the number of people that uh, get uh, HIV or other disease, it's going down till today. I think this trend has happened because we, uh, all, all the services that are working in arm reduction start to provide help to the people that are using drugs in the streets. Since Portugal decriminalised drug use, the number of people using heroin has reduced by 75%. It now has the lowest drug-related death rate in Western Europe and drug use among young people is below the European average. But while drug use is down, smuggling and dealing is still a problem in Portugal. Police drug squads conduct 2,000 raids a year like this one to catch and prosecute dealers. It's pre-dawn and I'm meeting Lisbon's police as they prepare to search the home of a suspected dealer. Commissioner Nelson Silva has agreed to take us along. So this is uh, the headquarters of the city centre police. We have regular police officers of police patrolling, riot units, and this is my service, criminal investigation, about robberies, scams, and in this case, we are going to do a drug dealing job. Okay, let's go. Today's team is made up of undercover officers from Lisbon's Criminal Investigations Unit. They've agreed to be filmed, but we can't show their faces. This is the team of the Grab and Go operation. This is my <laughs> from a special unit to, to grab a, a, a dog that we know is inside the house, OK? Decriminalising drug use means police are no longer tied up chasing users and can instead focus their efforts on catching the big fish in the drug world. We are keeping seizing drugs day by day by day. This here we have 30 kilograms of cocaine, 10 kilograms of MDMA. The last image is uh, 700 kilograms of hashish. So for every bag of marijuana that is confiscated, how many bags of marijuana do you think are sold? Thousands. Thousands? Yeah. It's now 7 a.m. and the officers are ready to strike. We have search warrants to do, so let's go to the work 
and everybody safe back, okay? The police have had a tip-off from a user that someone is selling drugs in a tourist area of Lisbon. Bora, quando quiserem. It's a good information. It's a good information point for us. Yeah. Just let me see if they grab the dog. Okay. Just a moment. The officers use a crowbar to break open the apartment door. I'm told to stay back and wait outside for my own safety. Inside the house, I can't allow to film, okay? There is some drug substances. I don't know the quantities. We aren't allowed into the apartment as drugs have been seized and it's now a crime scene. You can you, just do the, this, yes. this passing, okay? The person they've charged cannot be filmed. Finish, finish, finish. Just don't, don't film. What has your team found inside the house? We have many drags, a scale, and the mobile phone who has been stolen during a, a drug dealing business in here. The police have seized small amounts of what they suspect is cannabis, MDMA, magic mushrooms and cannabis seeds. The person has criminal records for drug trafficking. Uh, in this case, for international drug trafficking. Selling, it's a felony. He's going to be arrested, he's going to the jail. Do you think that it's possible to stop the drug trade here entirely? Or is it something you'll be chasing forever? So, it's our aim. But it's very difficult to, to strangle a, a drug selling point, a drug selling network. You can arrest two or three persons, but in the moment we arrest that people, he's already uh, another one waiting for his time to, to go up in the ring. Nighttime curfews and border closures due to the coronavirus pandemic gave police a temporary leg up on smugglers trying to get drugs into the country. But as restrictions are lifted, they're losing that advantage. We can see that now everyone is moving again. They are, they are doing his connections again. They are arranging the deals again. While the deal is arrested and taken into custody, we go back to the police station to weigh and test the drugs seized. This one. Oh, you can smell it. Yeah. <laughs> Does it always smell? Yes, so yes, strong? yes, yes. Every time? Yeah, every time. And when we have a, a big bags with this, oh, here. <laughs> Feel a bit funny after? Yes, yes, yes. All, all time, all day. <laughs> Positive too. You see the color? Yeah. It's the right color. This result told us that he, he, he's, he also he passed the, 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 the quantities of the, the, the drugs, no? Yes. So uh, it's a crime. He's in trouble. He's in trouble. Most of the drugs are sent to a lab for further testing, but the police have confirmed at least 45 grams of cannabis was seized. That alone is more than 25 days worth of drugs for personal use. The dealer will spend at least three months in prison and could face a maximum of five years for trafficking. Portugal took an unprecedented step when it decriminalised drug use in 2001. As a result, it went from being the drug capital of Europe, with one in ten people using heroin, to having one of the lowest drug-related death rates in the region. 
The main architect of Portugal's drug overhaul is João Goulau. He's the man other countries turn to for advice. Hello, good morning. <laughs> Hello. <laughs> good afternoon. Morning. Good evening. <laughs> good evening. <laughs> yeah. Portugal is about as far away as you can go from Canberra. In Australia, illicit drug use is growing and changing. The coronavirus pandemic has made it harder for users to access cocaine and heroin, while use of new emerging drugs thought to be more potent and more deadly has surged. Each state and territory decides its own drug laws. And last year, the ACT became the first jurisdiction to legalise the use and possession of small amounts of cannabis. Then, in February, a bill was introduced that would follow in Portugal's footsteps and decriminalise the possession of other illicit drugs. The man behind it is ACT Labour backbencher Michael Pedersen. In practice, the way that system works is police officers, when they come into contact with individuals that are using or possessing drugs, they confiscate the drugs, they direct that person to either an education program or a medical program, uh, and they don't send them through the criminal justice system. Whereas under our current laws, individuals are liable to go to jail for two years if they're caught in possession of these substances. When I talk about drug decriminalisation in the ACT, the most common issues that are raised with me uh, are people concerned that we're giving a green light to drug use. When drugs were decriminalised in Portugal, did you find that? Yes, the, the, the big uh, the big difficulties that uh, the, the most conservative people uh, faced at the time and uh, verbalized was, okay, uh, Portugal will become a paradise for drug users or uh, our children w w would start using drugs from with a milk bottle uh, in very early ages. Uh, nowadays, and 20, 21 years later, we can say none of these uh, problems uh, happened. Do you have any advice for Australia and its states and territories in considering decriminalisation? Well, the, the advice is mostly to have uh, health, responses, health and social responses available if you decide to do, to do so. This is key for the success of this kind of policy. Fazer análise, saber se está tudo ok. HIV, hepatite C, muito importante. Despite the progress that Portugal's made in the last 20 years, the long-term impacts of drug dependence linger. This van drives around Lisbon, giving out methadone to those suffering from heroin withdrawal symptoms. For Tiago the Potter, it's a life raft. 120 milligrams of methadone. It just feels like toothpaste. It's very easy to take it. There's one that uh, feels like a banana toothpaste. This one, it's, I don't know, a, a bad vodka or something. Not vodka, but a mix between vodka and toothpaste. Okay. <laughs> because methadone gives you the, the tranquility, the normality uh, for uh, more than uh, 20 hours. What happens if you don't come here? You begin feeling uncomfortable. Uh, you get upset with everything, you, you, you cannot do nothing, you, you have no strength to, to wake up, to, to walk, to... Oh, it's so bad, it's so bad, it's so bad, it's impossible. I do drugs for 30 years, if I have three or four hangovers in my life, it's too much, because I was so afraid of that, I always... While methadone suppresses Tiago's heroin addiction, it doesn't help with his dependence on other drugs. So why hasn't the world's most progressive approach to drugs helped Tiago kick his addiction? I don't, I don't know why I use drugs. I think it's very difficult to say. I think I'm happy, so I don't know. I don't know what I need. Tiago would like to see further reforms, with illicit drugs legalised completely, similar to the sale of alcohol. Tiago says it would take away the power drug dealers have, but there's widespread opposition to legalisation because of fears it would encourage more people to experiment with harmful substances and fuel addictions. It's, it's, it's what, you, what society wants to support, dealers, 
you give 400 for a dealer and then he broke your teeth and you cannot do nothing. So for you, legalization would stop that business, that of underground course. industry? Of course, of course. Two decades since Portugal took the unprecedented step of decriminalizing drugs, a lot has changed, but not every problem is solved. Drug addiction and dependence is still rife here on the streets of Lisbon, and the underground drug trade is thriving. But many lives have been changed and potentially saved by putting health at the centre of drug policy. Well, you've got another one here. I crossed Malaysia on a mountain bike. My life, I think it's quite normal. I developed perhaps a more healthy addiction to biking. I bike a lot. This is my bike. F fortunately, my, all my checkups are very good. I'm very good in terms of health and I think cycling is one of the reasons <laughs> I'm, I'm healthy, you know. As I told you, my daughter was born, I was still using. And then I had two sons, and now I have uh, four grandchildren. When you were 28 years old at the peak of your addiction, did you ever think that you would have the life that you do now? No, I was at 28. I was completely lost, you know, <laughs> and uh, I didn't see the light at the end of the tunnel, as you used to say. I had lots of anxiety no. on about if I could make it, if I couldn't no. make it, and if I could really be no you know, successful in anything in my life. What would be your message to people that are struggling through addiction and that don't see a future for themselves? Well, I, I think first of all, they need to have the desire to stop. That's the, the, the main thing. And some people, you know, unfortunately, they, they don't have the desire uh, and, and they die along the way. But if you have the desire, uh, you know, it's, it's possible for anybody to, to, to find, you know, uh, help and to, to overcome this illness.